So today we are still talking about how we know what's true. In fact, you're going to write an essay in which you're going to um, analyze and check out and figure out what's true based on who wrote it and what the claims are and what the evidence they use is and how you can trust the evidence. And um, I have one dog on my lap and the other one's begging to jump up. My lap's not quite that big. So, so let's, let's get started. Um, for some reason, my slide's not moving forward. And then it just moved forward a lot. So this is John Green. Um, how many of you have watched this video already? Uh, just let me know in the chat. Yes, 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 or no, no, no. You're fine if you haven't watched it. I just want to get a good read on the class. It's about, okay, so most of you haven't watched it yet. So you're, you're going to get kind of a preview of this. This is John Green. He is a novelist who wrote uh, The Fault in Our Stars. I, I have not read this and I have not seen the movie, um, but it was a very popular uh, movie. And so some of you may have seen it at some point. He's working with Stanford University and Google and some other organizations. And he's doing um, crash course videos and he's got a series of them about how we can make sure, how can we know what's true on the internet? And you'll need to watch this video. There are some questions that you're gonna answer and you need to answer them in some detail because it is, this is the, isn't the kind of assignment where you just give the basic answers and get all the points. So you kind of have to develop the answers the way he develops them in order to get those um, points. Anyways, John Green talks about how hard it is to know what's true on the internet, which we already knew. And we knew it even before we watched the videos from um, NPR and PBS last week. In fact, NPR and PBS are referencing Stanford University's uh, study, and they're referencing the program that Stanford University set up to teach people how to gain digital in di digital literacy. It's eight o'clock, I can't talk yet. And so they're working in conjunction and just fair news, Stanford University recently updated their curriculum and they asked one of my son-in-laws to work on that. So this is what my son-in-law has been doing for a while, working for Stanford University and Google. Anyways, that's a long story. In this video, John Green asks, how can we make the internet, which has all kinds of false information, how can we make it more positive force in our life, in the lives of others? There's so much misinformation and so much disinformation that we really, really have to become more literate in evaluating what we find on the internet. And he comes up with three questions that we should be asking. Uh, one is who is behind the information? And one is what is the evidence for their claims? And the third is what do other sources say about the organization and its claims? And he says, the more we know, the better we become at evaluating the information we find on the internet, we can make better decisions. So basically better information leads to better decisions. I'm having trouble clicking again. Ah, there we go. And I want to, um, by the way, this image is false. I actually did see it on the internet and somebody shared it in my Facebook feed where 
Stacey Abrams, and this was back in 2018, they said the Muslim Brotherhood was backing Abrams and she was a communist. She's not, they weren't, but you can Photoshop anything. And a lot of people believed it. Why did they believe this? Why would they think that the Democratic Party that she was running for would endorse somebody who was a communist? Why would they believe this? And here's a website that Politico or po yeah, Politico put together and they started collecting false information. Like here's a group of guys. I actually saw this on the internet earlier this week. We're making a woman's vote worth more by staying at home. I was like, really? Uh, or here's Mitt Romney saying, talking about Trump. Or Christine Blasey Ford, the one who testified against Kavanaugh. She actually was collaborating with Steve or with um, Hillary Clinton. By the way, none of these things are true. And so I want you, I'm going to send you into breakout rooms. And I want you to talk about when are we most likely to have difficulty determining false information? and why. Okay, let's get into some breakout rooms. Does that question make sense to you? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna put you into groups of three to four people um, and talk about, you know, like when are we most likely to get sucked into false information? When are we most likely to believe something that's not true? Okay, you're gonna get an invitation and introduce yourselves if you haven't already met and then start talking about that. Think about your own experiences where you've believed things that weren't true or where you've hesitated and said, I don't know, maybe. And it turns out that you didn't fully believe it but almost, or you could think about the things we talked about last week, where you believe something that was false, and then you found out it was, where you believe something that was false, and then you found out it was false, okay? So think about your own experiences, and now you get to be in your rooms for eh, about three minutes. Brian, Leslie? Hi, Michael. Hello. We just went into breakout rooms. So I'm gonna send you to, um, a breakout room and right. you're going to go to group two. Okay. All right. What are you guys talking about though? <laughs> um, they'll clue you in. We're talking about when are we most likely to believe false information? Okay. Thank you. All right. I'll see you in a bit. So it worked just fine. Why doesn't it work now?
Yeah, it worked perfect. And now it's not working perfect. And I'm so confused. I had a full screen and now I don't. You probably pushed it back when you Move the chair. Um, move the chair. <clears throat> well, I, if I move the, my chair up, I'm going to be. Uh, it's, it is, but I can't work like this. That's so weird. Um, but I can't. Yeah, it's just. <laughs> when are we most likely to believe false information? What makes us prone to accepting something that's kind of out there? Um, Sometimes we believe things that are on social media due to them being posted on social media by someone who we may think is credible. So we, so we believe people that we trust. So my friend who is a good friend and she's super skeptical, one could even say she's cynical, when she posts that something, that there are dolphins in the Venice Canal, I trust her. And so I might believe it, yeah. Um, what are some other reasons why we might believe false information? Yeah, Daniel. Oh, I was gonna say that when I was when we were talking in uh, with Ezekiel and with I think it was Kevin. Uh, I was saying that maybe if we're trying to win like an argument or we're desperate to find information, we might believe more skeptical so uh, skeptical sources. Even if we're a little uneasy about them, we'll still take them because we need it to fit our argument or whatever we're writing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I've, I've read a few research papers like that, honestly. Um, yeah, Ezekiel, what else? And to go along with Daniel, I was also talk, thinking that how we were covering how your emotions can get involved when it comes to looking at an article. So it can be a really shocking thing. You're like, what? And you're probably willing to believe it because it's has your emotions evolved to be shocked to see over see something like that. You might be willing to believe it, but you have to stop and think before you, um, you know, take that information in, because we don't know where that source is coming from and what the what the um, what it implies, basically. Yeah, that's really really true. Um, I'm thinking about my friend who posted the video of the dolphins in the canal. And so she was really emotional about it because she really cares about climate change. And so her emotions, she's really caring about climate change. And that meme that she posted confirmed what she thought. So it triggered her emotions and it confirmed what she thought. And therefore she decided it must be true. And she didn't even fact check it, which I told you, she actually teaches digital literacy. Uh, she lives in Jordan right now, but for a long time she was teaching at community colleges in San Diego. She was teaching English classes like this one. And I really trust her because she's normally right on with her sources. Um, last week, I showed you some memes from Donald Trump and both of them portrayed him in a very negative light. And so if you didn't like Donald Trump, you might've believed them and if you do like Donald Trump, you probably thought they were false because your emotions and your pre-existing beliefs determined whether you decided something was true or not. In fact, one of those memes was true and one of them was false. And so our emotions aren't the things that we should be 
relying on in order to believe things or not believe things. But often they are. And um, so we need a better system of determining what's true and what's not true. And that's why, um, and that's why John Green came up with those questions. Who's behind the information? What's the evidence for that claim? And what do other sources say about the organization and its claims? John Green gave, today we wanna to focus on the first question, who's behind the information? Because we should be able to determine we should be able to understand who is this organization? What do they stand for? What perspectives do they have? And we don't wanna talk about biases necessarily because we all have things we believe and those aren't necessarily biases, but they are perspectives. And so my friend's perspective is that climate change is bad. And if we're all moving about and using fewer fossil fuels, less fossil fuels, then we would be able to um, improve the environment. And my other friend who posted the negative meme about Donald Trump and was wrong, um, she didn't fact check it just because of her emotions. She didn't find out who was behind it. So here's what I want you to do. Um, John Green shows two associations of pediatricians. And I'm going to um, put these two organizations. I assume none of you have emotional attachments to pediatric organizations. Um, and so I want you to look at these websites in your groups. And I want you to decide which one looks the most credible, okay? And I'm not gonna give you a lot of time, but I want you to think about what makes them credible or not. So let me um, copy paste these organizations and put them in the chat. And then in your groups, I want you to look at them. So do you see those there? Okay. Now I'm gonna, so somebody needs to copy paste that and then share the screen and you can talk about what makes them look most credible. Okay. And you'll be going back to the same breakout rooms. Here you go. So let's talk about those websites. What made them look credible? What kinds of things were you looking at? Jose, tell me about those websites. What made them look credible? Well, I was looking at the dates they were published in May. And, and and so when were they published? I think one of them was published. Uh, I just I didn't see that find it out well, but it said two thousand two. Okay, so does that mean that the um? So what does that tell you that the website was published on in two thousand two? It's like recent, not recent, but like it already has like a couple of years, you know? So 2002, that would be 20 years ago. Yeah. So maybe that doesn't, I think that the publishing date is the date that the website was created. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. So actually the fact that it's been there 20 years would make it a good thing. 
Um, what I, so, but that's, those are the good things to look at when something's published. What other kinds of things were you looking at? Um. Um, Michael, what are some things that you, your group was looking at? Um, I was just reading it, but like, um, I, was, uh, I didn't actually look up into it really. I was just reading the information they have, both of them. And based on that, which ones did they, did they both seem credible? Did, was one credible and the other one not? Or what do you think? I don't know. I can't, I can't tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of hard to tell the difference. Yeah. Um, Lori, as you were looking at them, tell me what made them look credible or not credible. I looked more on the, the logo of it. I feel like the one for AAP is more like professional and it's, if I'm not wrong, that one's been here longer than ACP <clears throat> and ACP seems to be basically getting the same idea from AAP. Yeah, so I, I just, just yeah, I just pulled up those logos um, that Lori was mentioning. Um, yeah, the American Academy of Pediatrics has been a long, it, it has been around for a lot longer. So you thought that this when the, the first one, the American Academy of Pediatrics on the top, seemed more credible. Did was there a reason for that, Lori? Um, just in the design. I used to be really into design. So I know for a fact that that one would take way longer than the one on the bottom. The one on the bottom is really kind of doing the exact same thing that A. AAP is doing with the circle and the inner part is more like like structured I guess yeah other thoughts as you were looking at the websites what made them look credible and what made them look less credible Ezekiel uh, for me, we I personally watched the video, so you know I was able. To, I I knew which one was more credible, but for me to look at the websites, for me it was actually pretty hard to determine that because for the ACP, um, our group looked at the the website. I looked at the about us section, and there's a list of what their what the ACP's um, objectives are, what their motives are. Um, so I was kind of taking a look at that and almost seemed more like um, they're like articles to read, I guess. But the AAP had a lot of like, um, it had articles, but almost looked like a catalog kind of thing because it said shop AAP or, you know, had that kind of thing. But um, just from like first glance, the ACP almost seemed a little bit more credible, but that's just examining the, you know, the website, but not what, you know, based on the uh, origin of the websites. That's a really good point, Ezekiel. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned, you know, like you went to the About Us, which makes sense because A, you've seen the video, and B, our question that we're focusing on is who's behind the information and we should know the organization. So going to About Us is really good. And you mentioned, that as you could go to the about us, you could see what their motives were, like what they were doing in their organization, what their goals were. And that's a real key thing as you're working on um, knowing what's true and what's not true. So we are gonna go back to the breakout rooms in just a minute. And I'm going to ask you to examine an article. This is the article. It's titled Friendship Springs Eternal. And it was published in spring 2018 and in the Washington Post. And so I'm going to give you a link for this article in the chat, but I'm also going to give you a link or this slideshow. 
And actually, I'm not, I'm just going to give you the link for the slideshow because the slideshow has the link in uh, for the article. And I'm going to ask you to practice analyzing a text, focusing on who's behind the information. And so I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and these will be on your slides, and you can take notes on your slides. The first question I want you to look at is what person or organization sponsored the website or created the information? Because that's an important thing. If we want to know who's behind the information, we have to know about an individual or an organization, which is what Ezekiel set out to do in clicking on the behind us. We also want to ask, who's the author? Who wrote this? And what is